Welcome to today's webinar, Silage Session 1 on Forage Quality and how it impacts silage quality and livestock production. I'm Sophia Kuzik of the Education Team in Communication and Stakeholder Engagement at the Department of Planning, Industry and Environment and I will be your host for today. I'd like to acknowledge that as we are meeting across the state in this virtual space, each of us stand upon the lands of many different nations. I'm meeting on Gadigal land and I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land and waterway of the Eora Nation and pay my respects to their elders past and present and emerging. I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands and waters on which our online audiences join us from, pay respects to their elders past, present and emerging and extend that to all First Nations colleagues and guests that may be joining us today. I'd now like to hand over to Sue Street the Livestock Senior Land Services Officer within Central West Local Land Services to introduce the session. Thanks for that, Sophia. I just want to say, um, on behalf of Local Land Services, uh, we welcome you all here today for today's webinar. This is the first of four webinars which we'll, we'll run weekly each Tuesday from 10 a.m. during the month of August. This series of webinars is brought to you by the Local Land Services Ag Extension teams from across the state. We appreciate that across the state many people are keen to build their fodder reserves um, with some areas receiving very useful winter rainfall. Due to this we are expecting silage to be a good opportunity for producers to utilise excess crop and pasture. We do acknowledge that unfortunately not all areas of the state have been as fortunate as we have and we hope that rain will be reaching you as soon as possible. So silage is quite a complex, complex activity to undertake, therefore we believed it was important that we give our producers practical step-by-step -step advice in an accessible format. So we're really fortunate that today John Pilts of New South Wales DPI has partnered partnered with us to share his wealth of knowledge and experience in this area of part of this webinar series. So um, John Pilts is a Livestock Research Officer based at Wagga at the New South Wales Department of Primary Industry. John has more than 30 years experience in animal nutrition and fodder conservation and was the National Coordinator, co -co -coordinator of the Top Fodder Extension Program until 2005 and is the author of the Successful Silage Manual. So um, yeah, please John, we'd love to hear all about um, forage quality and how it impacts um, silage quality and animal production. Thank you Sue and thank you Sophia and thank you for everybody who's joined in this morning. Um, as they've pointed out, this is the first of four webinars. So we'll be looking at forage quality and animal production today. In later webinars, we'll be looking at some of the more practical aspects of making silage in terms of mowing and wilting, harvesting, storage, and also feed out. But today, we might have to slug through a little bit of um, background to silage and the, and the quality aspects so that when we get further down the track we're all on the same page. Now as, as Sophia said, I like it if people ask questions, it makes it a little bit easier for me. Um, normally one to one there are open questions and I get a breath for a minute but here if you could just type them in would be good. And I also have several questions which have been submitted beforehand which I'll try and deal with today depending on time availability and applicability but some are probably better left to later sessions. So what are we going to do, talk about today? It's, it, there are several topics that I want to address and, and the first one is obviously what is quality. If, we need, if we're talking about quality we need to be on the same page with using the same terms. I also want to give a brief outline of what actually happens when silage ferments, the effect of forage quality and silage quality on livestock production, and also want to talk about some differences between hay and silage. And I understand there have been some questions submitted on that topic and some specifics about silage quality, um, fermentation quality, which I'll do in that order. <coughs> 
I'd also like to start, start by mentioning this manual, the Successful Silage Manual, which if you type it in Google or one of your search engines, you will find it uh, on the department's webpage or the Dairy Australia webpage, and it's it covers a lot of the topics that we're going to do today in greater detail, plus several others. But if we move on, the first thing is, what is feed quality? In my opinion, for beef and sheep meat producers, the, the key components that we need to think about are firstly dry matter content, which is everything that is in that forage or silage or hay except water. And the reason we want to know about dry matter content is that all the energy, protein and minerals, which are what uh, allow the animal to, to maintain live weight and grow are all contained within that dry matter. So water itself is not a nutrient but it is extremely important when you come to sell, to buy or to formulate rations so that you make sure that you're feeding dry matter, not dry matter plus water. So for example 10 kilos of hay at 90% dry matter contains a lot more dry matter than 10 kilos of silage at 50% dry matter. So you need to adjust your rations accordingly. The second one is energy, and I'll use the term metabolizable energy. Um, the, it's the, other, the, second, sorry, the third of those characteristics is protein content, which I think we're all pretty aware of. And finally, minerals and vitamins. Now, in most cases, minerals and vitamins won't be tested or measured, but we need to be aware that in some feeds they're a little bit low or they're, and they need supplementing, for example, grazing cereals, but I'm not going to talk about them in any detail. So, metabolizable energy. I, I think this is the most important of the, of the aspects of a feed quality because metabolizable energy is the energy that is available to that animal for maintenance, for heat production and for growth, milk production, wool production and sustaining a pregnancy. In most cases, ME or metabolizable energy is the first limiting nutrient in most ruminant diets. Uh, often we hear about protein and there are some examples where that's the case, but generally it's energy content. And we actually measure energy content in what we call a metabolic chamber, which is a fancy um, arrangement where animals are essentially in a, a confined space which is hermetically sealed and the amount of energy they consume, the amount of heat they produce, the amount of gases they produce are all measured to determine how much of the energy is used for growth and, and maintenance. We can't really measure ME directly very often, so we measure digestibility and all, for all your feed test results, metabolizable energy will have been calculated from digestibility. It's not measured per se. And you'll see there are three different equations that we use. And you'll say ME, the top one for silages and um, forages, if is that ME is 0.203 times DOMD minus 3.001. Uh, DOMD just stands for one of the measures of digestibility. So digestibility, again, it's pretty simple. It's how much of the feed dry matter is digested by the animal under set conditions. So you can see from the example there, which comes out of a grass feed manual, that if a cow eats 10 kilos, and pass dry, 10 kilos of dry matter, and there's 3 kilos of dry matter excreted in the faeces, then we say that it's 70% digestible. There are several measures of digestibility, but the one we prefer to use is DOMD, and it's the one that you'll see on your feed test results. Why is that important? Well, put it in perspective, I calculated this out using grass feed. And you can see there that on the left-hand side of the axis, we've got live weight change in kilograms per day. 
And we have two bottom axes. One's metabolizable energy, and one is organic matter digestibility on a dry matter basis, which is DOMD, the one I mentioned before. As you can see there, that feeds that maintain weight um, have to have a, a digestibility of about 55% or an ME of about 8. But for every increase above that, you'll actually get an increase in live weight gain. Because essentially what's happening is up to 55% dry matter content, all the feed that's metabolized is used to maintain live weight. Everything after that is used for growth. Which means that what we see is for every minor increase in digestibility or ME, we can actually get a quite substantial increase in live weight gain. In this example, you'll see that for every 1% change in digestibility between that 55 and 75% or in MA between, it will equate to about 74 grams per day in live weight gain. 74 grams per day doesn't sound like much, but if we think about that, what it has over it, the implications with a major change, it's quite substantial. Alternatively, if you say increasing MA from 8, which is maintenance, to 12, which is less than most grains, it's worth 1.5 kilos, or just under 1.5 kilos per day. This graph is a silage feeding graph where live weight gain is expressed on the, on the Y or left-hand axis as kilograms of, per tonne of silage dry matter fed with... Um, megajoules of energy, uh, MA on the bottom axis, the x-axis. You'll see there that about, in this example, the line of best fit, about 8 live weight gain per tonne of silage is pretty low. It's less than 50 kilograms. But once you get up to 11, you're looking at 150 kilos per tonne of silage dry matter fed. So a, an increase between 8 and 11 is going to give you an extra 100 kilos of beef produced for every tonne of silage dry matter you feed. So we don't want to leave the lambs out. And you'll see here, I've used the same example as two graphs ago, and that if you increase live weight gain, uh, sorry, if you increase digestibility by 1%, DOMD value by 1%, that equates to an extra 14 grams per day in crossbred lambs at about 30 kilos in six months of age. So pretty typical of the type of animal that people will be looking to feed. So firstly, metabolizable energy is the major nutrient limiting in most cases. It's calculated for digestibility and small changes in digestibility can lead to large changes in live weight gain. We'll look at a few graphs later, which we've got some more data on. The, the second parameter we need to think about is protein content, because essentially what we need to do is ensure that there is sufficient protein to meet the animal's needs for the amount of energy that they're consuming. Additional protein is, is not of no real value to an animal, so we just need to provide sufficient. Again, we calculate out a value called crude protein, which is what you would have on your feed tests, which is simply calculated by measuring nitrogen content and multiplying it by 6.25. The reason we do that is pretty simple. Um, because it's when nitrogen is consumed, when protein is consumed by animals, much of that is broken down into nitrogen to be used by um, microbes within the rumen to help break down the feed. They then reform protein as, as part of that procedure and that is the protein which animals use, apart from a small component that passes through undigested. So essentially the best estimate of, crude, of protein for ruminant is crude protein. Okay, so they're the two main things that I believe we need to look at. Firstly, energy content and protein content when we look at quality. If we slip over now to silage making, 
what are we trying to do? We're, we're trying to take forage in a wet form, not dry like hay, and put it in an airtight environment and preserve it due to a fermentation process. So what happens is bacteria under anaerobic conditions, that means no air, convert WSCs or plant sugars to acid. The acid then lowers the pH of that silage and it's essentially preserved. It's similar to pickling, similar to putting vinegar on something and pickling it. The amount of acid that needs to be produced is affected by a thing called, which we call buffering capacity. And that dictates how much of the sugar is required to produce acid to counteract the buffering capacity. So, for example, something that buffers really well, uh, it requires a lot more acid, therefore requires a lot more sugar. Uh, the, there is a scale, and in practical terms, the buffering capacity ranges from about 100 to 150 for really easy to ferment materials like maize, maize forage, all the way up to over 1,000 for some of the broadleaf weeds. We need to be aware of that because we're looking at buffering capacity and, and sugar, how much sugar we need. Now, one option we can do is when we make silage, we wilt the material that increases the dry matter content, which concentrates the sugars, which makes them more available to convert to acid, to have a bigger impact on the amount of acid produced, and that helps to lower the pH. Unfortunately, if we have wrong bacteria dominating the fermentation, that causes a poor fermentation, which causes a foul smell. It breaks down the protein, which makes it less usable. You lose quality, you lose dry matter, and you lose um, energy content. And more importantly, you often get um, a very low intake because the animals don't like it. If we, on the other hand, increased dry matter content, we actually favour good bacteria, which means that the wrong bacteria can't dominate that fermentation. So therefore, if we're looking at making silage, there's three key components that, that um, influence the quality of the fermentation per se, as opposed to the quality of the forage. And they are WSC, or water-soluble carbohydrate, dry matter content, and buffering capacity. So if we... If we look at those in a little bit more detail, you'll see that water-soluble carbohydrates are produced, are converted to lactic acid by lactic acid bacteria, the same type of bacteria that's used to make yogurt. Now, there are two types of lactic acid bacteria, those which we call homofermentative, and all they do is create lactic acid from, from sugar. They're the most desirable in terms of there is no energy loss and the fermentation is quite rapid, leading to a low pH and stability. There are some, however, which convert sugar to lactic acid and other products. They're less efficient but are increasingly being used because they can improve the aerobic stability of silage, which is how well, it stays with, without heating once it's exposed to air. Now, we'll talk about that, that, that in detail in the fourth webinar when we look at feed out. The ones we want to avoid, uh, firstly, the enterobacteria. These are not necessarily responsible for a, a, an incredibly poor silage fermentation, but they're very inefficient. They, they use sugar without producing much, much acid, and they do produce or tend to produce a lot of acetic acid. So if you have a silage with a vinegary smell, that's probably one that's been dominated by enterobacteria. And they like warmer conditions, and they therefore can be more dominant, particularly in the warmer areas of Australia, and it's not unusual to see them in tropical silages. The, the bacteria we really do want to avoid, however, are Clostridia. Uh, 
Now they're all related to the clostridia that we, we vaccinate again with five and one. Clostridia are not wanted because they either break down sugar, break down lactic acid, and they break down protein, or all three. So, so rather than the sugar being available to be produce lactic acid, the sugar is broken down into things like butyric acid, which literally smells like vomit, um, and other products like carbon dioxide, and is no longer available either as an energy source or as a source of sugar for producing more lactic acid. In some ways, though, the worst thing they do is they break down proteins. So if you can imagine that in forages, most, pro most of the nitrogen is in the form of protein. About 80 to 85% is, is protein, and the rest is other lesser forms of, of protein. However, the clostridia, if they act quite a long time, they can break that protein fraction down and end up, at its worst case scenario, producing ammonia. Ammonia is heavily, highly degraded protein. We don't like ammonia because of two reasons. Firstly, it means the protein is fraction is degraded and becomes less effectively utilised by the animal. But secondly, it's highly unpalatable. And you can imagine that if, if a forage or a silage contains very high low levels of uh, of ammonia it it's both smells and not it's not a pleasant smell and not a pleasant taste and we'll look later at some measures of that and the last one we talk about is yeasts yeasts are the same as those that you get when you make beer or wine rather than produce acids they produce ethanol so the sugar is converted to ethanol there is no net value in the ethanol because it doesn't produce any reduction in pH. It's not an acid. More importantly, um, ethanol is very easily broken down when exposed to air by yeast and other bacteria. Um, and, more, and also, if you have a fermentation with a lot of yeasts, it means that those yeasts will be present when you open up the silage and that those yeasts will continue to, to function and they will start breaking down available sugars and other products quite quickly once they're exposed to air and you'll lead to instability. Now, that's, that's a pretty um, quick snapshot of the silage fermentation process and the bacteria and the yeast that may be present. We've also had a snapshot of the, the, um, the forage characteristics that might be important. So we'll now look a little bit more detail about the impact of some of these um, forage, con forage characteristics. In order to get a fermentation that's for lactic acid, bacteria, lactic acid bacteria, LAB, to dominate, we really want sufficient sugar content, WSCs, and what we do say, and this is the only example where we will talk about fresh forage, we require a minimum level of about 2.5% of the fresh forage because below that there is a poor risk of a poor fermentation. You can increase this with wilting, as I mentioned before, and it also varies with species. So sugar content, for example, is lower in clovers than it is in grasses. Maturity, sugar content varies in cereals. As it bec they become more mature, the sugar is translocated into the grain and to the starch. Weather, time of day, sugar content is higher in the afternoon. Sugar content is uh, an outcome of photosynthesization. So when the plants are exposed to sunlight, they, create, they use carbon dioxide to produce sugars. So overnight, there is a breakdown in sugar because there is no sunlight and the sugar is used by the plant for respiration. But during the day, the sugar levels build up again. And there's also an effect of nitrogen fertiliser. The 
the cause of which is not really known, but if you apply a lot of nitrogen fertiliser, uh, it will reduce the amount of um, sugar that's available and can have impact. So therefore, we never advise uh, fertilising just before making silage. Buffering capacity, which I, I mentioned before, is the ability of the forage to resist a pH change. If it is high, we need to, to um, produce more acid, which requires more sugar. It tends to be lower for grasses compared to legume. So we're talking rye grasses in the range of perhaps four to 450 units, as opposed to legumes, seven to 850 units. It's higher for leafy, vegetative, less mature plants, and it declines as plants become more mature. So therefore, older plants are easier in terms of buffering capacity to ensile but we'll see shortly there's some problems why we don't want to go down that pathway. Broadleaf weeds are probably the biggest um, concern because values of over 1,000 up to 1,300 have been seen in terms of buffering capacity. So if you've got a crop that's heavily dominated, for example, with cape weed, then be aware that that cape weed will will be um, silage with that cable will need to produce a lot more acid to get a pH drop. Fertilizer can increase buffering capacity and wilting can reduce buffering capacity, but they're they're difficult to quantify and you can't really guarantee them. So what you'll see if you get if you log on and have a look at that manual, you'll see in there we have a table or a chart which we call forage insolubility. So you'll see there that some down the left hand side we've got um, plants or forages divided into low, medium and high buffering capacity and we've got along the top forages divided into high, medium and low sugar content. So obviously something has got a very low buffering capacity and extremely high water soluble carbohydrate or sugar uh, content like sweet sorghum is very, very easy to install. Something that's got a very low sugar content and a very high buffering capacity is very hard to install. And you'll look there and you'll, you'll see that there's a lot of the plants we want to deal with that are in that difficult to install. Now, if we think back to the three components that affect the, from, of the forage that, inf that affect the silage fermentation, the sugar, the buffering capacity, capacity, and the other one is dry matter content. Now, we'll look at a couple of aspects of dry matter content in a moment, but effectively, once dry matter content exceeds about 30%, so 30% dry matter, 70% water or drier, the really undesirable bacteria tend not to be able to function very well and they don't dominate. So we have a tool which is wilting which allows us to manipulate the fermentation because we can manipulate dry matter content which leads to a manipulation of the dominant bacteria. Bear in mind this table though, because what you will see there is if you look at, for example, Italian ryegrass in the middle, uh, and it's, it's moderately easy to install. It's, it's in the middle. If you look at um, lupins or you look at grain, winter cereals that are more mature, same deal. They're relatively, relatively easy. So that means we, we can be close to that 30% dry matter content or just above that 30% dry matter content and there's very little risk. However, if we're down in that very difficult category, then as a rule of thumb, it's better to have dry matter content higher rather than lower, which is why we recommend a minimum of dry matter content of 35% for chopped silages. 
Now, bales are obviously different, and we'll talk about them later, but uh, 35% and even up to about 40% if you if you're looking at some of the clovers and why let's let's um look at how dry matter what the impact of dry matter content is we say too wet and too wet i'm going to say less than 30 percent ideal i'm going to talk about chop silage so i'm going to say about 35 percent and too dry uh, i'm going to say over 40 percent for chop silages with a couple of provisos. What you can see is if you look at that table, if it's too wet, you run effluent. And we'll look at some losses in a minute. But effluent is the liquid phase that comes out of a pit when it's made too wet. And most people would say, so what? It's water. Well, in fact, it's about 10% sugars and proteins and, min and some minerals and vitamins. So it, it, it's actually highly digestible. The dry matter content that, that, that's dissolved in that liquid is highly digestible, but more importantly, um, it's material that um, if it was to enter a waterway would be an extremely bad um, pollutant. It would lead to a lot, you know, it would be a very bad pollutant and you would need to make sure that somehow you manage it. Um, okay. And I'm just getting a question here, which I'll, I'll, I will answer shortly. Um, so, yes, so effluent loss, not, we don't have an, uh, any um, issues at the moment in Australia. We can normally do a pretty good job. But certainly in countries like Europe uh, or places like Europe and the UK where ensiling uh, of wet material is common because it's difficult to wilt, Effluent is a big issue and legally must be kept on farm because of the risk of it as a pollutant. Fermentation quality. Now, if it's too wet, at risk. It's at risk because of that fermentation being dominated by the bacteria we mentioned before. If it's too dry, it's at risk because it's often more likely to be dominated by things like yeast and moulds. And the reason being, if you look at the next one, ease of compaction. You can imagine if it's wet or ideal, it's pretty easy to compact. But as it becomes too dry, it becomes difficult, becomes spongy, air gets trapped into the silage. That air continues to um, let the plants respire. It allows things like yeast and moulds to start to grow, which potentially leads to issues with the silage quality and the fermentation quality. But more importantly, once those um, moulds and yeast grow during the ensiling phase, they're there when it's time you open. And we'll see in the fourth webinar that when they're present, it leads to instability and less favourable outcomes for animals. The other one we'll look at shortly is the impact of wilting on field losses and simply to say that as you the longer you wilt for generally the greater losses you get and that's going to have some implications which we'll see later for hay and need to be considered for bald silage so next i just like to touch on a couple of points here because some of these get thrown up as as favorable for for making silage. The first one I'd like to say is silage does not improve energy content of pasture. Similarly, silage doesn't reduce protein content. There may even be a slight increase in protein content of pastures or any of the forages, but it may change or it will change the form and it may change how efficiently it's utilised. I do sometimes hear ensiling may increase palatability. There, as a general rule, it, it doesn't, um, but there are a couple of examples where that is not necessarily the case. And one that, um, I'd, for example, is Yorkshire fog, which tends to be unpalatable and tends not to be grazed when 
it, to be it tends to be avoided when it's grazed whereas when you put it into silage it's consumed without any problems uh, but the other one I do want to say is fermentation quality has a big impact on intake and we'll look at some um, results of that both later here but also further down the track but definitely as I said I, I mentioned the example of high ammonia content um, worst case scenario I've seen silages with ammonia contents where 30 to plus percent 30 to 50 percent of the protein has been degraded into the form of ammonia so if you can imagine something with a crude protein of 15 percent and half of that crude protein is in the form of ammonia it's not a very nice product uh, right -o. so let's let's get through a bit of the nitty-gritty about making silage And we will get on to why is silage quality higher than hay quality. And there are four components, and they fit neatly with the four webinars, that where forage conservation has an impact on the quality of the product that you end up with. Initially, crop and pasture quality is the first, first phase. And you'll see there from this diagram there that there is no way to increase quality. Quality declines at every stage. It's, it's, it's unavoidable that there are losses and there are incre reduction in quality. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to start with the higher quality, highest quality product we can and minimise the quality losses as we go along. You'll see that the spread between, in terms of the quantitative leagues, the spread in losses gets bigger the further down this system and you'll see why later on so really we need to start with a high quality product if we start with something that's pretty average um, then we're never going to get any better than pretty average what then affects quality what's the most important thing that affects quality well this this again is another diagram which and we can talk through it but it pretty much identifies the, the different types of, of um, forages that we deal with. And you'll see there that as they go from vegetative through the reproductive stage, flowering up until grain fill in the case of, of the, the cereals, there is a decline. So all of the forages tend to decline across that period of growth as they become more mature. You will also notice that there is a difference in starting quality. So as a general rule, when they're vegetative, temperate legumes are higher quality than lucerne, which is the green line, which is higher quality than temperate grasses and oats, which is the blue, which is similar to, but slightly higher, perhaps in barley and wheat, and the tropicals, unfortunately, are last. You'll also notice that as uh, they, in, become more mature, some of the species lose quality more quickly. I'd also like to point out, so that gives you a bit of an idea of what you've got to work with, but I'd also like to point out that barley and wheat there, you'll see that it can, you can have a rise in quality. And we're talking about metabolizable energy content. That's associated with grain fill. Now, whether or not that kick again, that in slight increase in ME occurs will depend entirely on whether or not there is enough grain produced. And we'll look at some examples later on. So if there's very little grain produced, then don't expect that to occur. Think it's, think it's going to be more like a notes and just continue to decline. So what we've got here is some examples that from species that were grown at Wagga, and you'll see there, there are two types of oats. There's Cuba oats, which is down the bottom, and Calgan oats, which, you know, it's very, very, um, it's, it's very similar to the vetches and the peas and the starting point. And also you'll notice that ryegrass was the best in this example. It had the highest digestibility. 
So this was harvested at three stages, the 2nd of October, which is probably consistent with, with a silage, the 23rd of October, a late silage, 6th of November, a hay, a typical timing for hay. What you see is they all declined in quality over time, though in the case of peas, the decline in quality was relatively less, particularly initially, and then a slower decline afterwards. If we look at some um, legumes, just some clear, some sub balanza, arrow leaf, and barrel medic, you will notice again, if you can think back to the starting point before where ryegrass is about 75% digestible, they're a little bit higher, which is consistent with that clover being higher. What you'll also notice is the rate of decline there is relatively less than you did see for the grasses with the exception of balanza, and balanza declined quite quickly, which I interpret is a result of balanza having a lot, a relatively high stem to leaf ratio, and stems less digestible as it becomes more mature. But it certainly means that yes, initially quality is high, but you really need to be aware of what you're working with to see what the impact's going to be as they get more mature. Putting this in perspective, and remember I mentioned about these dates being similar to early, late, silage and hay. I've got some data here, which is European data, and it's for ryegrass, and it's made into silages. And it's over silages produced from ryegrass, which is cut over 28 days. So there's an early cut, cut 14, and cut 28 days later. First thing you'll notice there is that as it becomes more mature, intake tends to decline. There's not much difference between the last two, um, and it, it's a little bit higher for late, but there is a decline from early to late. And that is typical of what happens as digestibility declines. And you'll see that digestibility has declined from almost 71% to 58% over 28 days. Um, what what you'll and, and so therefore that quality decline is mirrored by an intake decline because not only is the material what happens is not only is the material less digestible it is digested more slowly which means that they are full and they can't eat as much but see what happens live weight gain at the early cut it's 1.14 kilos per day and it declines to 0.44 kilos over that 28 day period. So 700 gram reduction in live weight gain over 28 days. I um, use a rule of thumb, which is for these type of forages, um, which are grass to temperate grass type silages, the quality probably declines about half a percent a day. So think about it. We'd go back to what I said before, 1% equals 74 grams per day in, in steers. So every couple of days, you lose 74 grams. So you can see that delaying harvest from early to late is what leads to a big reduction. Now, when people say silage is better the quality than hay, really what they're saying is silage is produced from much earlier cut material when the quality is much higher, which means that the the value quality feed value of that silage is higher than produced for hay if it was cut from the same pasture or same forage crop, if you can follow. Now, there is an impact of extended wilting on quality, but the main impact which determines why a subclover or a ryegrass pasture silage is higher quality than hay made from that same paddock is the time at which it's cut and the quality of the forage at which it's cut. It's nothing to do with the ensiling process per se. It's got nothing to do with fermentation quality. It's purely a forage characteristic, and it's why it's important. To give you an idea of what sort of things we can see, these are just some results from 
17, 18, and 08, 09, and I don't want to spend much time on them, um, but we now, if we now look at wheat and canola, which are um, quite common um, in terms of the last, in last couple of years and sort of earlier in the drought, wheat and canola silages are extremely common. And you'll see there that the, the value that I've got in 08 and 09 and 17 and 18, uh, they're the ME's 9 and 7.9 and 9.2 and 9.2. They're the averages. But what I really want to show is the range. And if you look below that, you'll see that the poorest quality was 5.2 and 5.7 in 08 and 6.5 and 5.3 in 17 and 18. The second, whereas if you produce the highest quality, they're incredibly high value forages in terms of ME in wheat in 0809 and wheat and canola in 1718. Canola in 0809 didn't. Now, that gets to a, a bit of an issue of when should we cut both forages um, with canola I think the data has shown now it's pretty obvious that if you cut early, you will have an extremely high quality product which has got a really high protein content and is very, very useful. Every time you delay, that really has an impact on, on the quality and at no point does it appear to decline, to, to go up again. It's just a continual decline. That's what we've seen. Granted, canola is usually cut in a drought year, but I don't think it is going to make much difference. You could ask about, you know, if you cut later and there's some oil there. Um, firstly, over a certain percentage of oil is not good for rumen function anyway, but more importantly, canola seeds are pretty small, and particularly for cattle, I would guess a lot of that would be excreted. So, so it might show high energy content because of the oil, but if it's not utilised by the animal, it's worthless. So in terms of wheat and canola, and I would go so far as saying barley, um, I would talk about cutting early as being the ideal stage. If there's a huge increase in yield and there's a kick up in ME, you may very well get it, it may very well offset, but um, in my experience, in most years in Australia, um, if you want forage quality, go early. It's a it's a safer bet. Now, now one of the questions I've had is looking at when to harvest barley for for both yield and quality, particularly if you're looking um, at using it in a feedlot ration. As a follow-up to that, which also says, has any correlation been done between sugar levels, a BRICS reading, which is what the, what the wine people use, levels in barley and composition of energy, protein and digestibility? We'll answer the second bit, not that I'm aware of. I have heard of someone playing around with it, but I don't know anything. In terms of barley, the correct time to harvest barley is if you want a high quality forage, I would always recommend going at the boot stage, which is when... You've got, usually got sufficient bulk there to make it worth your while and you haven't entered that quality decline. Alternatively, the, the, the recommended time to harvest barley and also wheat, if you're specifically looking for a feedlot diet which um, contains a proportion of lower quality roughage and higher levels of starch, you would cut when that crop is at about the mid, soft to mid dose stage. The rationale being that what you've effectively done there is you've gone for immature grain, which still has a lot of starch, plus your straw component, which is, which is the, uh, the stover component. Now, what's the best is, is really going to depend on what you want to do. But in my opinion, if you're, a, if you're not in a feedlot, you wouldn't delay that stage. If you are in a feedlot and you do delay that stage, one of the advantages is you don't have to wilt. So it becomes a direct cut option. The dry matter content at that stage is about ideal because the plant has naturally dried down with maturity. Um, 
it, it reduces the losses because it becomes a direct cut option. But in terms of maximum quality from a forage diet, you're probably behind the eight ball a little bit, but you may have more yield if you're prepared to put it in a feedlot ration and, and maximise growth with more grain and other supplements, it's probably fine. But again, really going to depend a bit on the on the crop you're working with and get some testing on it. We've also got one here about the quality of bicerula silage. Uh, bicerula is a, a new legume and it appears to have lots of advantages in terms of production, particularly in the drier areas, but for those of you who don't know it, but very little has been done with Bicerula in terms of conservation. If you look at it, it, it um, probably is not suited for hay because it, it's a very fine-leafed plant and likely to suffer extensive damage and loss when you're handling it. But other than that, the only recommendation or advice I can pull out about Bicerula is to say that if you cut it early before it gets too stemmy, you've got a, generally a high quality product and I doubt it would behave really much different, but we're not sure to most of the legumes. The issues, potential issues with photosensitization seem to be uh, ameliorated by cutting. The, the compound seems to disappear quite quickly after cutting. So quality of silage at this stage, I would say, assume it's similar to um, I would assume it's similar to just any other legumes. But we'd like to contact you. Um, I know Belinda has, and we'll talk about whether we can get some samples and do something. On that cereal, and one of the reasons why I said what I did, is I um, I wanted to show you some results here. And one these were ones that were done in Wagga in R8 and tomorrow in 10, where we grew the same seven cereals, two wheat, uh, two wheat and two barley and one triticale. And these are averages. So A8 was an incredibly tough year. Yields are very, very low, as you can see. Whereas 10 was one of the best years I've ever seen and yields were exceptionally high. You can see there that in the tough year in O8, Proteins, the crude protein content tended to be higher and at all stages than in 10 when it was a really bumper crop. As you'd expect, quality protein content declined over time. If we look at the right-hand side, the interesting one there is ME content. Um, metabolizable energy content started off in 2008. That was incredibly high. So 12, 12 and a half is effectively close to barley and grain. Whereas in 2010, it was only 9.9. .9. In both cases, it declined. But a couple of key points that, that come out of that. Firstly, same stage of maturity, massive difference between years in terms of ME. I would argue that most years, your normal year, if we ever have a normal year, is probably somewhere in between. The second thing I'd like to point out is that um, while, while the um, decline occurs in all years, you still end up with a really high quality product in 08 in terms of M8, but not so in 2010. One of, the, one of the reasons that I attribute that high ME content is to the amount of sugar. Now, you'll see the sugar contents of those crops in 2008 were extremely high, whereas those in 2010 were more normal or lower than you would normally, slightly lower than what you would expect. Now, if you do your sums and you talk about whether you cut early or you cut at that later stage, Firstly, you'll notice that in the first year, things are tough. You didn't get much yield increase. You got a yield uh, quality decline. It was still very high quality, but there was really not a lot of advantage in, in terms of delaying when you utilise that crop. Whereas in 2010, there was a significant yield increase from a good season, but 
your MA decline to the extent that at that milk stage, it's not a lot better than a maintenance ration. If you say Catalina and MA of 8, 8.7, they're going to grow very, very slowly. And the protein content is borderline. I mean, it's a bit low. For a production ration, it's too low. So in both those cases, whether there was a yield increase or not, there was no advantage in delay. So I would say, um, based on this and similar stuff we've seen before, firstly, your average is going to be somewhere in between those, but there's never a reason why I would advise anyone, excepting for the example of the hot, good quality um, wheat or barley into to a feedlot or a dairy type ration. But in a straight, typical silage on farm, I would I would say that's the safest option to take in terms of ensuring reasonable quality, rather rather than banking on uh, banking on the amount of um, the, the any benefits for potentially increasing yield and increasing yield per hectare of the forage crop. Uh, did, there's a question here. Um, what's the buffing capacity of brassica? Uh, high. It's it's up there. It's probably 800, maybe higher. Um, could be over a thousand. Uh, so again, brassica is one that you're really going to make sure that you wilt properly, and one that I would suggest you wilt to at least a dry matter content of 35. One of the pluses, if you think about it, those plants like brassicas and clovers and that, that need the, to ensure you get over 35% dry matter content, they they will really rapid, relatively easily compared to some other plants. But more importantly, even at those higher dry matter contents, they're relatively easy to pack because they can be sticky. They don't have hollow stems, with the exception of, say, balanza um, and similar. They tend not to have hollow stems. They tend to be sticky and packed together pretty well. Um, another question, and um, I might just slip on. There's a couple more questions, but I might slip onto this one. Um, so we, talk, we talked about losses, and, and effectively, look, you can see a lot of this in the manual, and we will do some losses during the wilting and harvest session next week, and we will definitely do losses during the feed-out, the two weeks later, but losses during storage, um, essentially, if you if you keep it and store it, and it, it there is no air or no water enters that pit or that bale, then there shouldn't be any losses during that storage phase. I want to put those into a little bit of context. Um, I mentioned too wet before and, and too dry. Now, this is a this table, or this figure, sorry, is, is in the manual. Uh, it's an amalgam which is trying to put together the dry matter losses from different, from different components of the system at different dry matter contents. And it starts assuming wilting direct cut 15% dry matter material, which is what used to occur many years ago. And you'll see there that, as I mentioned before, that first lot, the losses under the green line is the effluent losses, and by about 30% they decline. The losses between the green line and the brown line are storage losses, and they tend to be reasonably constant, though um, a little bit higher at the bottom end and certainly a little bit higher at the, at the drier end, which is due to essentially um, more um, air penetration and a few things like that. If, if you look at field losses, you'll also see that field losses go up as the material gets drier. And that's for two main reasons. Firstly, respiration. So as the plants um, are wilty, they're still alive, they'll respire, so they'll lose sugar and dry matter content. That slows down after about 30-35% dry matter content, 
and ticks away slowly. But at that stage, mechanical losses start to become more important. So as the material dries, it becomes more brittle. And every time you rake it or tear it, um, it will lose some material and some of that material will, will be lost forever. And unfortunately, it's usually things like the leaf, which are higher protein, which are more brittle and um, are lost first. So you can see there that the lowest total losses on the blue line um, are probably around that 35%, just under, so that around that typical chopped silage area. Now I, I'm aware that barred silages are normally produced at about 50%. My opinion is that I understand why that's the case and I can see reasons why that's the case but I would not support what going too much. So there are people that would make bale silage, square bale silage in pits and come back at 45% and be quite happy with that, whereas some people choose to go out to about 60%. And my comment would be it's a, it, the product looks fine, but you've probably lost material that you didn't need to lose if you'd have produced that bale at about 50%. So in terms of optimum dry matter for bale silages, my personal view, if it's if it's bales, square bales, I'm happy to see you come back to about 45% and certainly 45% in pits where you've got some stability. The, one of the issues with being two with bales is stability if they're stacked, particularly if they're stacked in modules. Um, they, they can get heavy, they can slump and you can get losses. But if you've got them and the bars well formed, they're nice and tight, it's not really um, a problem in terms of instability. I, I, I think that you can get away with 45%. Um, with brown bars, same sort of answer, but for God's sake, stand them so that they're on their flat side. And the reason why you would stand them on their flat side, and we'll show you some pictures in the third webinar, but the reason being that um, if they are wet and they get heavy and they start to slump, the sides will tend to collapse on them and that will tear the plastic, so the plastic can become brittle and break. Whereas if you stand them on their flat end, that, that slumping won't occur. More importantly, you've got more layers which give you a barrier against um, the, the soil surface, which, you know, for things like bugs and and whatever crawling in, and more, and you've also got more layers at the top, which presents a better um, a better outcome in terms of sun damage, uh, UV damage. So UV eventually break down plastic um, wrapped bales, and wrapped bales are therefore generally said to have a storage life of about 12 months. That guarantee. Um, so that's why. Now, if we if we I'm trying to do some questions as we go here, but as you can see, losses go up as you get drier. The other thing to note there is as weather conditions deteriorate, so their weather conditions are poorer, you'll get greater losses. And that'll come about for a number of reasons, but firstly, it'll take longer. So you, know, you can see there, to get to 20%, it only takes about a day, up to a day, whereas if you're trying to get very, very um, high dry matter contents, you know, almost to the, the hay stage, it's going to take you three to eight days to get to about 80%. What happens when weather conditions are poor, they tend to be overcast and, and maybe light showers and things. The material stays fresher f for longer, which means any respiration that occurs is more prolonged. When plants are cut, they're no longer producing sugars, but they're still respiring, so they're still using the sugars that they've conserved from before. That will continue until they're all used up or dry matter content is too high for the enzymes in the plant to, to respire. If it's overcast, weights of wilting are low, that respiration will go on for longer. The other thing is, their ideal conditions for the growth of moles and, and yeast and other compounds. So that's why poor conditions lead to greater losses. So again, 
If conditions are good, you can make silage very, very quickly. But if conditions are bad, it's more difficult. But it certainly means that hay is out of the um, out of the question. Now, what I've got here, which is also in the manual, is a table which shows typical forage conservation losses. So we're talking about that wilted silage versus hay. And you can see there that the losses, you're still going to have those losses in the field that I mentioned before, the 5 to 8%. Whereas, but hay, because it's drier and you've got more mechanical loss, you're going to be looking um, at 20 to 25% losses. Now, in terms of storage, you'll see there that we're talking, the figure that's quoted there is 6 to 7% losses. Now, that takes, considers that in under um, previously, silages were made um, and allowed to ferment naturally, and a portion of the dry matter was essentially converted into carbon dioxide, heat and water as it, as it fermented. With the advent of bacterial inoculants, particularly the homofermentative lactic acid bacteria that drive that fermentation very quickly, losses due to fermentation have been reduced. I haven't seen any really good figures on it, but I know there are claims that it can be as low as 2% in some cases. Interestingly, hay... Um, Stored in the shed, you're still going to get, get some losses, but if you store it outside, they're going to be horrendous. Um, the feed out, now those losses are again looking at a reasonable system, and we'll talk about them in more detail later. So, hay versus silage, and I'm nearly finished except for some questions, but um, hay versus silage, pretty simple then. Silage is less prone to weather, so therefore you can cut earlier and you can maximise those the quality of the forage when it's at its peak or close to its peak. You've got less field losses. However, you do have a risk of spoilage if air gets in and the same for water. The, the, uh, the other thing I'd like to say is, or reiterate, is that palatability, the palatability can be reduced if fermentation quality is poor. A couple of last slides that I want to show before that. First one is I've got some more hay and silage data, which is, this is West Australian data, and it looked at hay or silage produced from annual ryegrass subclover pasture from two adjoining sections of a paddock. Obviously, the difference was in terms of when they were cut, with one being cut at about the 10th of October, and the hay being cut at about the 6th of November. And they were fed with some grain in the diet. What you can see there is, regardless of how much grain they had, the live weight gain from the silage treatment was always higher than the live weight gain from the hay treatment. The, the um, proportional of additional gain um, may not have been constant, but to a degree that's understandable because as grain increased as a percentage of live weight, grain became a more significant part of the ration. So in at 1.5% grain fed to the hay, that would, be, would have been over 60% probably of what they consumed. So it, it dilutes the effect of the hay versus the silage quality. But you can see there, a practical example, why we, we end up with these figures that say silage is better than hay. Um, finally, I want to just show you a couple of tests. I mentioned the silage fermentation quality as being the additional factor which can affect intake and utilisation of the protein, even though feed test quality in terms of MA and pro crude protein can be fine. There's two tests we do. The most valuable one, as far as I'm concerned, is that silage ammonia, which tells you how much of that nitrogen was degraded. 
The other one is silage pH, and, and we'll have a look at a table now which shows, again this is in the manual, which shows some indicative pHs for silages produced at different dry matter contents. Now the first thing you will notice there is that it only goes up to 35%, which is where we go with chopped silages generally, or a little bit higher. You'll also notice it's a little bit lower than grasses. So it's an indication that if you've got a higher pH than that, probably got a poor fermentation. You don't have to worry about um, the bale silages so much because it is so dry, the dryness knocks the bacteria around so they can't ferment as effectively. And effectively, once you get about 50% dry matter content, there is very little fermentation, so there's very little pH reduction from acids being produced. Really what what you're looking at when you get up to dry matter contents of about 50% is basically storing material in a wet form wrapped in plastic so the air can't get it and that's that exclusion of air is what pretty much preserves it rather than production of acid because that's minimal. It also explains why, and I've often heard the comment, it's really beautiful silage, it smells really sweet. And bale silages often smell sweeter than those from top silages. The sweet smell is purely and simply sugar. It's the smell of sugar. If you think it's the same reaction as producing yogurt, with the, with the bacteria produce lactic acid like yogurt. Now, I'm not a yogurt eater but I know yogurt doesn't taste sweet. Lactic acid isn't sweet. So, yes, it's a nice product, but that's why it's a nice product. Um, what I think is more important is to look at how much that protein is degraded. And if you do a feed test, they will give you these figures. So if your ammonia nitrogen as a percentage of your total nitrogen is less than 5%, I would say fermentation quality is excellent. If it's in the range 5 to 10, which is pretty reasonable, it's good. 10 to 15, not so great. And certainly by that stage, you would see a reduction in intake because of the fermentation quality. And greater than 15, it's poor. And as I said, have seen them almost 50%. So they're terrible. So when you do your feet test, if you're feed testing silage, it's worth getting this additional test done or doing the silage packing, getting getting the pH and the ammonia and nitrogen done. They come as a package and that will allow you to make an assessment of whether or not your silage fermentation quality is excellent or good, in which case intake should be reasonable um, and the lower it is more closely related to... Um, to the forage it was made out of, whereas if you up around that more than 10, certainly more than 15, don't expect the same level of production without supplementing with grain or some other factor. Now, um, finally, I would chuck up one more test. In the event you've got... Um, browning reactions that really concern you. The materials become really, really hot. They heat. And this can be hay as well as silages. Now, ideally, we want to avoid heating. But if it does heat, what happens is some of the protein binds to some of the fibre in there. And both the protein and becomes less available and the fibre becomes less available. So you do get a reduction in how useful that protein is tends to taste very sweet and animals like it, but you've lost energy, you've lost protein. If you are at all concerned that's been an issue with hay or with silage, you can ask for a test um, which effectively measures the amount of bound up protein, which the protein that's bound to the fibre and therefore it's indigestible to animals, which means it's no longer useful either as a source of protein for the bugs in the rumen from which to, to break down other fibre and, and, and grow or as a protein for the animals later on. Got a couple of other questions here we might, we might go through. How does barley grass in pasture impact silage quality? 
Good question. It then depends entirely on the stage of maturity of the barley grass as to what its quality. Earlier on, it's high in protein, high in energy. It's, it's a good feed. It tends to be very low and difficult to cut. And I should have mentioned earlier, it's a bit like those uh, drought stress crops when you've only got two tonne of material. I would strongly recommend not. They become a grazing option because the losses, once you go under two tonne, they can become quite excessive in terms of mechanical losses when you're cutting and, and raking and teething and things like that. Assuming... Assuming it's part of a part of a pasture and it's not, it's going to be captured. Um, the issue with barley grass comes in later on. If it has gone to head, and it's a chopped silage, what can happen is animals can consume that, and it gets caught in their mouth, um, and you'll see it, you'll get ulceration, you'll get bleeding of the gums and bleeding of the bleeding on the tongue and all the rest of it. Um, effectively, barley grass in silage, bale silage is similar to barley grass in hay in that it's not nice, it can cause problems in eyes and irritation, and if they eat it, can cause problems. If you ensile it, it doesn't appear to lose any of those barbs, it doesn't become any easier, and it, it still has the same or similar impacts to in hay. With barley silages, um, particularly sheep, seem to be able to avoid the barley grass to a degree, and it's not such a big practical issue. However, with cattle, if you have chopped silages and they're fed as a ration, it becomes difficult for them to avoid it. And if you look in the manual, you will see there's some pictures about which show the impact of barley grass, and a small proportion of barley grass in an oat and silage, which has led to quite severe mouth lesions and lacerations. So that's how I would treat barley grass. Effectively, if you've got a lot of barley grass, I would spray it out. However, if you've got a small amount of barley grass and you do cut it and put it in silage, it is probably going to lead to... Um, a reduction in barley grass the next year because you've taken that those seeds away. Interestingly, we, we did have a little bit of data here when we looked at looking at pasture and cutting and timing of cut and the impact on barley grass. And what we found was, uh, yes, early silage cuts um, seem to favour more subclover, but late cuts, early November cuts for hay, favoured barley grass. The barley grass had already set seed um, and therefore you cut the clover, the clover didn't come back. There was a lot of barley grass. Now that varied year to year depending on season with obvious differences between season on proportion um, but I would say read the manual, treat it cautiously but from a fermentation or quality point of view Cut early, it, it, there's nothing wrong with it. Also got one about Kaikuya pasture. Is it best cut early, summer rather than later? It doesn't really matter when you cut it in terms of time of the year. What matters is how mature it is. So if you've got, um, and, and this is the same pretty much for everything. Like I've, I've mentioned cutting time. Probably what I should have made clearer, it's, the maturity of the plant at the stage at which it's cut. So if if it's vegetative, it's high quality. If it's reproductive, it's declining. If it's got seeds formed, it's it's quite low because all the goodness in the plant has gone into that seed head. Uh, with uh, with um, kaikia being a little bit diff different, you're looking at having something that's very leafy and trying to avoid having those stems in it. So you would manage, it would be more a case of managing that pasture to ensure you're not going to be cutting a lot of those sort of older, lower quality leaf and stolons. Other than that, timing is going to depend on whether, whether you're more likely to get summer storms or not and what's the easiest time to do it. But we'll, we'll look at some tricks like next week. But I have, I know of people who can make kaikuya silage in under a day, all things going well with tedding and a few little tricks, which we'll talk about in our next webinar.
How long after opening a silage pit do you ha have before the silage, silage starts to spoil? Entirely dependent on the material. It can range from a couple of hours if it's bad maize or if it's un relatively unstable maize to several days if it's a very stable silage like a lot of lucens are. We'll talk about that in detail and how to manage that in webinar four. But essentially, the things that make silage go off are exposure to air, the presence of substrates like sugar and ethanol that are really easily broken down and when they break down at heat and you have the presence of things like yeast and moulds in sufficient numbers to start that heating process quite quickly. There is also management of the face to minimise that but we'll, that's a longer topic, we'll talk about that later. And in terms, the difference between haylage and silage, well technically haylage is, is um, is a trademark product that refers to really dry silage. I think it was the stuff they used to put in harvest stores. But um, my my explanation or the way I view Haley versus silage is the, the one is just a dry variation of the other, which has very little fermentation and relies on uh, effectively uh, utilising their packing it tightly, utilising any available air that's there and sealing it so that it remains stable. Silage does the same thing, but you also have that fermentation which leads to a pH decline. can lead to some other issues in terms of protein breakdown and all the rest of it, but fermentation with silage, very little or no fermentation with halides. So I have seven minutes left. When did you want to come in, Sue? Yep, I can come in now. So I'll just conclude some stuff. But um, So thank you, John, for your time and sharing your knowledge with us all. We've had some really fantastic questions today and we're looking forward to answering some more of your questions in the next three weeks. Uh, with the mix of pastures and crops across the state, all with differing states of maturity, um, it's great to kind of get a practical understanding of when's the best time to make silage and uh, we really hope that you guys have enjoyed today's webinar. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this is just the first of four webinars aimed at developing your understanding of silage production and use. Um, and just a reminder, if you can't attend a live event, you can access the recordings of the webinar after each week's event, but you can only do this if you have registered. So thanks again, and we look forward to you joining us next week. Thank you, Sue. Thanks, everyone. And sorry to those people who host questions I didn't get to answer. Though quickly, I could, there's two here. Can you make silage from medic or loose? And the answer is yes, you can do a really good job if you wilt it. And my last slide there, if you need help, contact local land services. But thank you very much. Thanks, John.